don't want to step into the next life and not be right with God. Right? I mean, let's be honest. You don't even want to live this life and not be right with God. As we've been studying this book of Romans, we've been looking through this long 60-plus verse case that the apostle Paul has been making that the day of God's anger is coming. And it's coming because of our sin, right? He writes about it in Romans 1.21. He says, yeah, they knew God. They, that's, that's you and, and me, they knew God. But they wouldn't worship him as God or give him thanks. And instead, they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. We knew him, but we wouldn't worship him. We wouldn't put him first. We'd rather do our own thing, right? We'd rather do our own deal. We'd rather live our own lives our way. And so, you know, you read through this long, long, long passage and you find out that God's angry at each and every one of our sins and at all sinners for those sins. And it's really easy for me and you, good 21st century American Christians, to read this passage and kind of feel like, you know, God gets really angry at what I do, right? I mean, he's the king of the universe, but for some reason, he's really picky about my behavior. I mean, somehow, what I do or don't do can really seem to upset his apple cart. And I just want to take a pause, and I just want, to, I just want us to look at this and, and really realize what's happening, because come on, really? I mean, seriously, do you think that God, that God is not big enough to handle your anger issues do you really think that God is not big enough to handle who you sleep with do you think that God's not big enough to handle you know what you lie about or what you cheat on or who you talk about behind their back is God really small is he actually really petty is God really actually fragile and do we need to tiptoe around a very overly sensitive God or is there something else really going on here think about it you've been betrayed before right has anybody ever betrayed you you know what that does to you there is nothing that can stab you in the heart harder than a betrayal by someone especially someone close. The closer the relationship, the deeper the hurt from the betrayal. And isn't that what's really going on here? The closest being to God betrayed him. Right? In heaven, this betrayer accused God of not being worthy of being God. This accuser divided heaven and waged war against God to prove his point that God isn't even worth being God. This accuser seems to have broken everything. He's gone from being a, probably a worship leader in heaven to being the main accuser of God himself. He has totally and utterly betrayed God and this accuser continues to lie and cheat and steal to prove his point to make his ongoing never-ending case against God and this accuser continues to lie cheat and steal you you God's beloved creation you were lovingly designed by God to uniquely reflect his glory you were designed to be a light bearing 
image bearer of God. You were designed to live a life that points to Him, that reflects His glory, that shows His holiness, His peace, His perfection, His unity. That's who you were designed to be, but the accuser has broken all of that. And now, the things that consume your life all seem to now agree with the accuser that God isn't worthy of being God. That you and I would rather worship anything besides Him. That we'd rather fill our lives with all of the crap that the world has to offer than worship Him. And this breaks the heart of God. It's not about who you sleep with. It's about who you've aligned yourself with and who you've aligned yourself against. So Paul tells us in Romans 1, he says, So their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Because we've aligned ourselves the wrong way, it shows up in how we live. Our lives reflect the wrong God. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception. <sighs> Malicious behavior, gossip, backstabbers, haters of God, insolent and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. My parents were in the last service. Heard an amen on that part. Dad did not confess to it later. They refuse to understand. They break their promise they're heartless. They have no mercy. They know. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them also. Yet our lives seem to agree with the accuser that anything is better than he is. That any God is better than the one true God. We'd rather worship whatever we can get our hands on than worship him. So of course his anger is coming. Of course his day will come. He will defeat all of his betrayers. But the good news is God wants you back. That's the first blank on your page. God wants you back. This is Paul's message. This is God's word through the Apostle Paul that he wants you back. Now, there's nothing, 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 nothing you and I can do to scratch and to claw our way back. We've been looking at that in this early part of Romans 3 for the last several weeks. Nothing we can do to be right with God on our own. Even the law, the old covenant, was just a temporary and insufficient means of being right with God. Just doesn't really work. It's temporary. It was even temporary as they were doing it. You had to keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over again. But Paul writes in Romans 3, it's what we're studying today, that he that you and I can't get there on our own but that God makes a way he wants you back he loves you so much that you couldn't do it so he makes a way are you listening to me he makes a way that's how important this is to him he makes Away. And right here in this passage that we're looking at today, Paul makes this really clear. We've been studying this passage for the last several weeks as Paul is using some kind of cumbersome verbiage to say the most important thing in the entire Bible. This is it. In fact, we've said, we've seen that the theologians call this paragraph the most important paragraph of the whole Bible. And today, I want to look at the pivotal word, of the most important paragraph. This is going to be really, really important, and I hope you're taking notes. I hope this will really sink in 
to all of us as it's really been sinking into me some this week. Romans 3, here it is. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Remember, we've been studying this the last few weeks, uh, that God has made it possible for us to be right with him apart from the law. He's made a way for us to be right apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. In other words, okay, so God makes a way. The law was the old way, and it didn't really work well, but you can see where he's going with it. The law and the prophets bear witness to it. They are pointing to the ultimate way. You can see it all in the old covenant, all in the old law. We're going to look at it a little bit today. So God's made it possible for us to be right with him, uh, and you can see where he's going in the old covenant. It's not your righteousness. We talked about this last week, two weeks ago, sorry. It's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. My righteousness, your righteousness, is nothing but filthy rags. It's it's worthless. It gets us nowhere. It's not my righteousness. That's never going to work. It's the righteousness of God. It's his own righteousness that he gives us through faith in Jesus for all who believe. That's what we've been studying so far. He goes on and he says this, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are broken and separated from God under the death penalty, under the judgment of God. All of us fall short, can't get there on our own, but we all can be justified by his grace as a gift. He graciously gives us the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He graciously gives us redemption in Christ. Now, we love this. We love this, love this, love this. This is a huge thing for us. We talk about this all the time. But right after this comma, Paul does something really strange which is what I want us to look at today. Remember, Paul's a prolific writer. Before he writes Romans, he's already written five other books that make it into the New Testament. He'll go on to write a bunch more, and he'll total out at writing either 13 or 14 books of the New Testament. This one guy writes about a third of the New Testament. So he says a lot. He writes a lot. Dude, he's got a lot of things that he wants to tell us about. And he says a lot. A lot of the same things, themes come back over and over again through Paul. But here's what's weird. In all of his prolific writings, including in Romans, in all of his writings, Paul chooses to use a word next that shows up nowhere else in what he writes. This word is a word that he uses one single solitary time in all of his entire library. So this word is a special word. It's a very intentional word that he uses, and I don't want us to just graze right past it. I want us to get it because I think this one word, I think Paul's chosen this word and reserved it for Romans chapter 3 because he wants us to see something that you can't really see anywhere else. So I want us to look at this word, and dude, it's a doozy of a word, okay? I mean, it's a big, it's a big word, Are you ready? Let's look at it. So he's talking about Jesus through Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a, and here's the word, propitiation. Uh Uh-huh. That's the word. Propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Christ Jesus is the propitiation by his blood for our sins that we receive by faith. Propitiation, that's the word. Isn't it? That's a word, isn't it? Can I get an amen? <clears throat> ran out of breath just trying to say propitiation <laughs> so listen your name has to be Susan Farnham to be able to work propitiation into casual conversation am I right Amen. 
you probably don't even know what that word means. It's kind of up in the air. We think we know what it means. We kind of know what it means. We sort of know what it means. But dude, that's kind of a, you know, word. What in the heck is propitiation? Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. So the next blank on your page is the definition of propitiation. It is a sacrifice that takes away wrath. It's a sacrifice that takes away wrath. Now, we love this idea. This is a great idea, and we talk about it all the time because our entire theology, all of our entire system of belief is based on this idea that Jesus' blood covers my sin. Can I get an amen? Amen. Jesus' blood covers my sin, and we love this. It's so important, but, 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 but. Paul chooses this word because this word shows us that Jesus' blood covering my sin is only a part of what Paul is showing us here. Because covering, covering my sin, is that really what I need? Is that really all I need? His blood covers my sin. That's great. But what does that mean? You see, I think when you talk about covering, I think, I think if you're just talking about your sin being covered, I think that sounds a lot less like the way God deals with sin and a lot more like the way we deal with it. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Let's just pretend for a second. Let's just pretend. Let's all just use our imaginations and let's pretend that I have a time bomb. All right, I got a time bomb. And it's slowly ticking its way down. Okay, just a little, nothing, no big deal. It's just a time bomb. Uh, I'm just going to set that right here, and we're just going to leave it sitting there. Um, if, there's, if that's really a time bomb, are you going to want to stay in the room with the time bomb? No, because that time bomb, it's, well, it's probably dangerous. Is it dangerous to God? Is your sin dangerous to God? Who's it dangerous to? It's dangerous to us. But what if I told you, okay, it's a time bomb, and, you know, it's going to go off in about 27 minutes. No big deal, though. I got a solution. Got the solution right here. I'm just going to cover it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's totally fine. It's covered. Don't worry about it. It's okay. It's covered. Is that, is that a good enough way to deal with that time bomb? I'll be like, hey, Dale, when the service is over, I'll just leave this covered. Would you take this home? Just as you're driving, just hold it on your lap as you're driving home. Is that going to be okay? Yeah? Probably not because it's covered, but I'm pretty sure it's still, yep, still there, still there, and still dangerous to me and to you. I think this is much more the way we deal with it, right? Because you've been in that argument with your spouse. And you remember you, after it was over, you apologized. And, you know, I promise I'll never, honey, I'll, I love you. I'll never do that again. And she's like, oh, oh, it's okay. I love you. And we're okay. We're good with it. And we get past it. Until the next time. <laughs> you blow it again. And she's like, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> right? <laughs> Boom. It goes off. You know it's true. It's not just her that does it. He does it too. Am I right? We deal with it all the time. You say that you're over it. You're past it. But then, boom, it goes off. You say you're over the way that person hurt you that time. But then you bump into them and, boom, it goes off. You say you're in recovery and you've gotten past all the addictive substances And then that call comes in, they want you to hang out, and boom, it goes off again. You say you won't react that way in that difficult situation any longer, and then boom, it goes off again. Yes, Paul is saying that Jesus' blood covers our sin, but I'm so grateful that propitiation is so much more. With this one word, he's drawing a much better, much deeper, much more nuanced picture than simply covering. When Paul uses this word, this one word, Paul is saying something super, super, mega, ultra profound. 
Paul isn't just using a word that we'll take for granted and run by quickly. When Paul says propitiation, Paul is drawing a straight line back to Leviticus chapter 16. Because in Leviticus 16, God is giving instructions to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, on how to conduct the most important day of their year. I mean, the biggest single day of their year. Bigger than Christmas. Their big day. It's the day that everybody gathers together. The day that everybody brings their sacrifices. It's the big day. He's giving instruction on the day of atonement. Excuse me. And so in, sorry, Leviticus 16 God is speaking to the high priest, Aaron. And he's given instructions on how to prepare for the Day of Atonement. So he's talking to the priest. He's not talking to all the people. He's saying, okay, priest, okay, you're kind of in charge. You're the mediator on behalf of your people. That's what a priest is. And so if you are going to mediate, if you're going to stand between a sinful group of people and a holy God, you better get ready. You better, you better get ready. And so here's what he says in Leviticus 16 to Aaron. He says, when Aaron, the high priest, enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. Be careful. Be careful. Don't take this lightly. You don't just waltz up on God. When you dare to approach a holy God, dude, you better have your junk in order. You better have your ducks in a row. You better be ready. In fact, here's what he says. He says, be careful. Obey these instructions fully. He says, he, the high priest, must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So first of all, he's got to come with offerings. And for the priest, he's got to come with a bull and a ram. This is a much more personally costly sacrifice than everybody else had to bring because he's the high priest. So he doesn't just come with a goat like everybody else or a sheep like everybody else. He comes with a bull and a goat, a ram. He comes with both to sacrifice on his own behalf. Be careful. Get clean first. And he goes on. And he says, he must put on his linen tunic, the linen undergarments worn next to his body, tie the linen sash around the waist, and put on the linen turban. See how he keeps going back to the linen? He's talking about the linen garments because these are sacred garments. They're sacred garments. So he must bathe himself in water in the mikvah, the ritual bath before he puts them on. Yeah, he's got he's to bathe and be clean in every respect. Physically clean, spiritually clean, ceremonially clean, before even approaching a holy God. So this is a big deal. And Aaron must, it goes on, take from the community of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering so it's two goats and a ram and then he must take the two male goats sorry I'm skipping ahead Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family making them right with the Lord so he gets clean before God and then he must take the two male goats he takes the two male goats and presents them to the Lord where? at the entrance this is a very public place all of the people of Israel, all of God's chosen people are gathered around to witness as the high priest presents these two goats. There's two goats. How many goats? Two goats. Now there's two. There's two goats here. One of these two goats will become the sacrifice. So he's going to be cut up, the blood spilled, 
and he's going to be burned as a sacrifice to God. The other goat is going to perform a very different function, not like the first goat. The day of the atonement requires two separate goats for two separate functions. I'd love to show you what I mean by this, but I would need a goat to really show you. If I only had a goat. Oh, look, there's a goat. <laughs> good job, good job. Hi, Evan, thank you. Yes, look at that sweet little goat right there. So, in Leviticus, they're told to bring the two goats. One goat will be the sacrificial goat, but the other goat will become the scapegoat. You've heard the term scapegoat. In Hebrew, the word is Azazel. Everybody say that with me. Azazel. Yeah, so the word Azazel means scapegoat. The definition of the Azazel is to take away. The Azazel, the take away or the do away with or the away with it goat. The take away goat. And so the Azazel is the one who is going to become the scapegoat, is the scapegoat. So, here's what would happen. God gives Aaron these instructions in Leviticus 16.20. When Aaron has finished purifying the most holy place and the tabernacle and the altar, he must again present the live goat. He will lay both of his hands on the goat's head and will confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and the sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer, transfer, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. Then a man, specially chosen, or a woman in this case, <laughs> specially chosen for the task, will drive the goat out into the wilderness, and it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. So this person chosen would always be a Gentile, not a Jew. Because if you're a Jew, a Jew you don't want to be anywhere near this loaded goat, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Because all, all of the sins of all of us are transferred to the goat. Now, tradition tells us, we know they did this. It's not in the Bible. It's not part of the Bible, but it's in the Talmud. And it's in the Mishnah. It's in all of the priestly commentaries of the day that in addition to these instructions that the high priest would also take a red cord and uh, he'd take that red cord and when laying hands on the goat he would place this red cord on the head of the goat not on its neck not on its back but around the head of of the goat, and he would lay hands, pray, and transfer the guilt of everyone. Yeah, I wouldn't want it either. <laughs> so he would transfer the sin onto the people. And then afterwards, and before the Gentile person would take the goat out, they would remove the red cord and they would hang it on the outside wall of the tabernacle, later the temple. And over the course of the next little while, that red cord would mysteriously, maybe miraculously, fade from red to white, symbolizing the fact that the red guilty sin of the people has been taken away and cleansed by the scapegoat. Now, remember, that part's not in the Bible. It, I knew you would do that. I knew, thank you. Oh, good, it's number one. Yeah. Good goat almighty. Wow, I mean, really? Wow. I think it's Lee that he doesn't like because Lee's going to have to be right here. Okay, one minute too late, you may take the goat. Thank you. Oh, oh, good. Wow. That goat did so well in the early service. <laughs> oh, 
So this is really important. So they would, they would put this cord on them, and the cord would turn white over a period of time. And it's not found in the Bible. It, it, we know they did it, but it's not found in the Bible. Unless maybe when you look at Isaiah, who wrote many, many, many years later, many years later, and he writes that though your sins are scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Maybe he's not dreaming this language up and pulling it out of thin air. Maybe he's talking about something that he sees on an all-the-time yearly basis. The good news is that the way God deals with our sin is, next blank on your page, he doesn't just cover, he removes. He doesn't simply just cover it over, pretend like it's not there. He doesn't just sit there and live in denial and lie to himself about it. He doesn't only cover it, he removes it. He takes it away. It goes out into the wilderness. And in the Jewish mind, the wilderness is a place where God really isn't. It's a place of disorder. It's a place where God doesn't occupy. Because when God occupies something, he brings order. Right? He, he puts everything together. But chaos is where God doesn't really operate. And so it's just thrown out into the chaos. No longer just covered, but also removed. That's God's goal for you the whole time. His goal for you is to not live in denial, but to live free. To live pure. To live clean. So many of us come from a religious tradition of shame and guilt. You know, we, I, I know I've seen it before where you're raised to believe that you are bad. See what I did there? Yeah. Yeah, you're bad. You're really, really bad. And it seems like God's goal for your life is to keep reminding you how bad you really are. I'm mad at this, and I'm mad at that, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and that God can't handle the things that you do. But propitiation says that you were that, but you now are new. You're not that old you anymore. The Bible says, God tells us over and over and over again that when you're in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. That you were dead, but now you've been given life in Christ. You were dirty, but now you are clean. You were a slave, and now you're free. You were the enemy of God, but now you are a friend of God. He calls you sinners no longer. He calls you saints and co-heirs to the throne with Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to be excited about that today. Come on twos. Let's, let's hear a little bit of nine or ten. Over and over again, his word tells us that we are no longer this. That the time bomb is no longer ticking. He's telling us that you actually are new. That you actually are free. Paul himself writes to the church at Corinth. And he says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The old life, did you hear me? The old life is gone. And a new life has begun. That's what his word really tells us. Maybe we aren't in the word enough to know who we really are. And maybe if we could just sink ourselves into the word a little bit more, we'd know who we are. And maybe, maybe if we knew who we really are, then doing the right thing would come a lot more naturally. Hello? Back to two, apparently. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because it's been removed. So, this is what Paul is describing. He's describing propitiation. That that old covenant has been pointing to Jesus all along. Right? And gospel writer John, I think, agrees with Paul. John shows us that at the end of his ministry, Jesus is captured. He's taken away and put through that fake trial, right? And then he is beaten. 
fact, in John 19, Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Boy, you think, I think when they pressed that crown of thorns on his head, what would that have looked like? I wonder. Could God have been pointing to this all along? And then a little bit later in John 19, Jesus is presented before all of the people, the Jewish people. And Pilate says to the people, look, here is your king. And what did they say? Away with him. Away with him. Azazel is what they screamed about Jesus. And next, a group of Gentiles led him out of the city to the cross where he covered and removed our sins. I think that's why the prophet Isaiah writes, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've each left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. That's what propitiation is. With this one word, the apostle Paul is showing us that Jesus is the sacrifice for all of our sins. He is the covering for all of our sins. Jesus is also the high priest. He's the mediator. He is the one transferring our sin away from us to the scapegoat. And Jesus is the scapegoat itself. He's the one removing. He covers, he mediates, and he removes our sin. It's done. It is finished. Can I get an amen? amen? So, the enemy's gonna come and he's gonna accuse you again. He's gonna start pointing out all the stuff. It's not God, it's the enemy pointing out all the stuff, accusing you. Yeah, you blew it again. Uh huh, uh huh. Let me see, let me see. Uh huh. Oh, look, still going, still going. It's about to blow up. Getting close. Uh huh. See? The enemy is going to come to accuse you yet again and again and again of blowing it with God. But all you have to do is look around the room and say, the goat has left the building. Come on, the goat has left the building. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are not enslaved to sin any longer, but if you're in Christ, you are free. You don't have to live that old life anymore. You don't have to be bound in slavery to its dictates, but you can live the free, abundant life that Jesus has already sacrificed and covered for, that he's mediated for, and that he has removed your sins so that you can live. The goat has left the building. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.